I think this recording has started. Um, I hope so. So, um, day 16, the recording in class this morning, for both the 8.30 and the 10 o'clock, for reasons that are beyond my understanding, the recording didn't work. So I'm hoping at the moment that it is working. Just let me toggle back and forth. It looks like it is. Well, it says that it's sharing my screen. <clears throat> so let's try zipping through this. That what we're doing today was actually what we should have done, well, scheduled for last Wednesday and today. So it's, but actually we can fit both classes in one. It doesn't take a long time to cover. This is more of a survey of classification, um, part one of a survey of classification. So let me back up. <laughs> uh, so we did value estimation. Value estimation, it was predictive models where we're trying to predict the value of a variable that is numeric. So that like, an assignment, it was the price of a house. Uh, in class, we did the balance on a credit card. But now we're switching to classification where we're trying to predict the value of a categorical variable. A nominal or an ordinal variable would be categorical. And that uh, examples of that would be trying to predict whether or not a customer is going to stay with the cell phone plan that they have with us, or are they going to switch to a different company like TELUS or Rogers? And we'd like to be able to anticipate if it's likely that they're going to switch or not switch. And we're going to categorize them that way. Or maybe we're looking at credit card transactions and we want to know, is this a valid credit card transaction or a fraudulent one and categorize them that way. But those are both examples of binary ones, and those are the most common ones we'd do. They're the most straightforward for us to get our head wrapped around. But I should say that in classification, there may be cases where we're going to classify individuals into different groups, no, not just two groups, but three or four groups. If I wanted to predict, uh, is this student likely to study arts, or they're going to study business, or they're going to study science, or predicting what major they would pick, there I've got different categories. Maybe I'm trying to classify this customer. This is a customer likely to be satisfied with their service, dissatisfied with the service we're providing, or neutral with respect to that. So I've got different categories. Maybe on an ordinal, that's a satisfaction, is an ordinal variable. The, whoop, I got to switch through these. Hello, there we go. The difference that we get with respect to these things in, in making our predictions is trying to measure accuracy. Accuracy and value estimation was predicting how, knowing how close are our forecasts. If I'm trying to predict the price of a house, can I predict it within 5,000, 10,000, 50,000, $100,000? How close is my prediction likely to be? Or even in, we were doing causal analysis within that value estimation. So I'm predicting the price of a house, but I know that the size of the house is important. And I estimated that each square foot was worth $200 towards the value of the house. But that's an approximate thing. It's an estimate it's based upon data. So could it be worth $250 or $300 per square foot or as low as $100 a square foot? How accurate is that 200? Is it close or, you know, are you pretty confident it's probably between 180 and 220, or is there more error to it? So we've, we've got error that we were measuring in terms of how big that error is. Well, it changes this. There isn't size to a classification error. Uh, how do you measure closeness? If we're predicting whether or not you switch cell phone providers or don't switch, you're either right or wrong if you're predicting this is a fraudulent transaction. It's either it's fraudulent or it's not fraudulent. So what's right, what's wrong? We, uh, like most data mining 
applications. We're dealing with big data, large data sets. We're looking at activities that are repeated over and over and over again. And when we're measuring our errors, we're not looking at maybe at this specific case, but looking on average, how good are we at making predictions? What's our error rate? What percentage of our classifications are correct? So classifying that transaction as being fraudulent, uh, when it is fraudulent, that's a correct one, or valid transaction when it is valid. But what about the mistakes? That ones we classified as fraudulent when they were actually valid transactions, or ones we thought were valid transactions when actually they were fraudulent. How do we measure these different types of, you know, if we're measuring mistakes, it's, it's the percentage of time we're making mistakes. And the, to understand those, we need to understand the consequences. And I think at the start of the course, I gave the example of when I got a credit card through TD Bank. It was a Visa card. And I it wasn't long afterwards, I was using it in Bermuda to do recru student recruitment. I spent several days in Bermuda. And I went to check out of my hotel and my credit card was declined that there was something wrong with it td thought i was it was a fraudulent transaction that they thought it unusual that i was in bermuda i presume they when it was flagged as being potentially fraudulent i guess they phoned my house but of course i wasn't home i was in bermuda and didn't get the call and because i didn't respond they then put a block on my credit card. It gave me some grief, but found a way out of it. Thankfully, I got home again. But a couple of years later, uh, a similar sort of situation in that I traveled, I don't travel often, but I traveled to Jamaica and uh, for my daughter's wedding. And when I got back, I got my statement and there was about $1,000 in charges on it that I never made. And they were actually made after I had returned to Halifax again. So this was a case of fraudulent transactions that they had approved. So they made both mistakes. They declined my credit card when the transaction was valid, and then they okayed my credit card when it was a fraudulent transaction. The consequences in the first case, I had trouble sorting up my hotel bill, but I got it sorted. In the other case, uh, there was $1,000 on my credit card that I didn't spend. TD covered that cost. They corrected those charges. But that meant TD lost the uh, $1,000. Different things affected customers, their customer service, their relationship. Uh, this is very different in terms of talking about errors and, and the consequences of them than we had in value estimation where we made a mistake in predicting what a house price was and how big an error we might have had. That uh, the whole area of evaluation classification is far more complicated than it is with value estimation. And we've devoted a whole chapter to it. We're going to look at chapter 11 at evaluating model quality in classification problems. And But we'll deal with that later. We, there's, what we're going to do today is talk more about the different approaches that might be used to try to um, make predictions of what category you should be in. So there are many different approaches, and we're doing a survey, high-level survey. We're not going to get into the weeds of actually applying these tools, but we'll look at the ideas behind them. Why are there different approaches? that in value estimation, we had only one, and it's the most widely used method for it. Why are there so many with classification? Well, it's because there are different ways of approaching it, far more different ways. One of them might be if you're trying to predict between uh, that are, is it fraudulent or valid on one extreme or another, we might start out by looking at, well, can we assess the likelihood or probability that the outcome is 
if it's a valid transaction or a fraudulent one. And then given the probability, know what the risk is that it might be, we'll make a decision on how to act. So that's actually two steps. One is estimating the probability. The other is acting on the probability. So uh, the, like, if you think it's a 60% chance it's fraudulent, you might say, whoa, I'm going to put a block on that transaction. But suppose it was 30%. Mm -hmm. That's still a high risk. Uh, depends upon the consequences of being right or wrong in that decision. Suppose it's only 10%. Mm -hmm. And it's likely valid. I can upset the customer. Uh, the smaller the probability, the more likely you're going to say it's valid. The higher the probability, the more likely you're going to say it's fraudulent. You need a decision rule. Okay, that has to do with evaluating consequences of your mistake if you're wrong. So that's an evaluation thing. Again, we'll look at that in chapter 11. Right now, let's estimate that probability. And how do we estimate the probability that it's fraudulent or not? We're estimating a probability that then that means we're estimating a number. And estimating a number, given a variety of inputs, sounds like the valuation problem. And we just said regression analysis is the most popular tool for value estimation. So could I use regression analysis for classification? Well, let's try it. Here's, this is just contrived data. Um, Imagine a situation, um, you're a large corporation, you've got hundreds of employees, that um, the, you need a screening device in the hiring process that get lots of applicants for a job. So uh, maybe you administer different types of aptitude tests to those employees. And that um, used to be, I don't know if it still is today, but at once upon a time, it would be common to administer one that tests your numeracy skills. Could you handle percentages? That's, that's a big one in many instances. Simple mathematical operations. Logic skills, which tend to come up in math. And then verbal skills. You know, can you, how well can you read and interpret documents? And understand what the main points of a paragraph are, that type of thing. Uh, that how do you process verbal information? And so they might have a math test and a verbal test or something along those lines. Suppose we got scores, you know, and you could get a score of you know, 200 to 500 or something on these tests. So if they had been applying that in the past, so in the company uh, human resource department, in their records, they'd have the test scores. And maybe we take a sample of employees. We ask some managers to come up with samples of employees of ones that if, if they were to hire again, given what they know about the employee, they would say, yes, I definitely hire. That I really like their performance. Or no, if I could do it all over again, I would not have hired that employee. I'll give them a no. So let's suppose we've got a sample of 10 good employees and 10 bad employees. And we look through the HR files and we find, well, how did they score when they applied? So I've got those scores and the ratings, good, bad, just like we did before with binary variables. We're coded them as one for good and zero for bad. And what I'd like to know is build a formula say using regression, to predict the likelihood they're good or bad. I know these ones either were or weren't, but maybe I could estimate the probability that they would be good or bad. Put all this stuff, throw it in Excel, um, into a regression formula, and come up with uh, the, an equation. So I did that. I put it in. Excel was happy. There are a bunch of numbers. 
and it fit a formula that I have here. Now, the uh, don't get thrown off by the little coefficients, the 0 0.0072, it seems like it's not very big, so the math score couldn't be very important. Well, that math score, as you saw, was like 300 or 400 or something like that, maybe 500. So that's a big number, 400 times 0 0.0072, it's gonna give you 0.28. That sounds small, but remember, I'm trying to come up with a, a rating between zero and one. One is perfect, yes, guaranteed I'd hire him again. Zero is no, definitely not hire this one again. So 0 0.28, that's, a, that's sort of in that scale of zero to one. And similarly with the verbal one, it would, um, it's a small number, but it's times a larger one. That's why it's where it is. Now the R square is in this model is 53%, not great probably not great accurate predictions, but it does suggest that there's a pattern between the math and verbal scores and the rating that explains 53% of the variation. Um, so what's the model really telling us? It's a different model. <sighs> Ratings are zero or one, yes or no. It's a binary variable, but when we use binary variables before, they were on the right-hand side of the equation. That it's where we have the math and the verbal. We would have had, like previously, we had one with the uh, predicting credit card balance where it was student or not a student was on the right. This time, the binary variable's on the left. And it's interesting. Look, if you're not catching what I'm saying, look at the scatter charts. <laughs> They're very different. So the y value, the vertical value, can either be a zero or a one. <laughs> That's it. You're either good or you're bad. And if I look at it, I'd see mm, those with low math scores tended to be bad. Those with really good math scores tended to be good. And those in between were split. Verbal scores? Well, those with really good verbal scores tended to be good, but everybody else was all over the place. This is a little different. And putting a line through it? <laughs> this, these, these lines don't seem to make an awful lot of sense, do they? Well, but we can do it. We can put all these things in the formula, put the mass score in, the verbal score into the formula. Out comes a rating on the other end. What do those look like? They're not just a zero or one. It's not flip, yes, no. It ends up being a number. And look at the numbers. They go as low as about minus 0.2 and as high as plus 1.2. Now, these are supposed to be probabilities. That a probability of zero applies to something that can never happen. It's impossible. So how can you have something that's less likely to happen than being impossible? And one means it's guaranteed to happen. It absolutely has to happen. So how could you have a probability more than one? How can you it be more than absolutely guaranteed to happen? So some of the numbers are silly. If we were to just draw a line at 0.5 and say if your value, your rating is above 0.5, you're good. Below 0.5, you're bad. Then you can see that actually a lot of the time I got good predictions. <laughs> I made the right decision. And a few times I made mistakes. I had ones that uh, are bad employees that got above 0.5 in terms of their rating, so I'd hire them. And I've got employees that would I should have hired, but I didn't because they scored too low. I made mistakes there. But majority of the cases, you know, this is probably 16 out of 20, I got the right decision. And four times out of the 20, I goofed. Hmm, not too bad. That uh, estimating the probabilities, no, I got a big standard error. So, you know, this should be uh, an outcome of one, and I'm getting numbers that are all over the place. And this should be an outcome of zero, and I'm getting numbers all over the place. So, no, um, there's a lot of variability here.
let's try to make it better. Well, how can I make it better? Uh, I'm in this odd situation with the outcome that having to be a zero or a one, but maybe if in that, when I was putting a line there, instead of having a straight line that looks silly, maybe I put a curve that goes and stays, it goes from zero up to one, but it doesn't go below zero, doesn't go above one. It's got to go flip from one to the other, but I could do that with a curve like this one. So here's a model that if your math score is really low, I'm going to give you a zero or close to it. And if your math score is really high, I'm going to give you a one close to it. And in the middle, I'll make a transition from one to the other. So I've got a Kirby relationship here. That um, this one here, it seems to do well at the low end and at the high end. Problems in the middle, but maybe once I include verbal score, it'll help me out with the ones in the middle. So this curve is called a logistic regression curve or a logistic curve, and the method of estimating it is called logistic regression. It's not standard within Excel um, that uh, we can do it. We can. There are procedures in Excel that I can set up so that it can be solved. That, um, but we're not going to go there. It's. I don't think there's a lot of benefit in going through that at this stage. That the concepts. You not only have to have a good understanding of probability, which isn't as simple as you might think. It uses a thing called odds ratios. Those are used in, like in sports betting. When you think, uh, well, um, what, what are the odds this team's going to win the game? And you might have, the betting odds might be three to five. That, what does that mean? Uh, well, in the betting situation, it means for every three people that think that are going to win, there are five that think this team is going to lose. And so, that has to do with how the money is being bet and the, the payout that's going to be. But you might think of it as being, uh, if there were eight games, we think they'd win three and lose five. Are they going to win this one coming up? Well, we don't know. They could, but they're more likely not to. But it's, so it's, it's sort of like probability, but different. And then the actual technique for estimating the formula of that curve, and I'll show you the formula in a second, is not as simple as ordinary least squares that was used in regression. It uses something called maximum likelihood estimation, which is rather involved. And, but we don't need to get into all that stuff. The formula is ugly, scary, whoops. And, I, well, you don't need to use it per se. That, Computer is going to do all the work, and so even if the formula is ugly, computer takes care of that. It, it isn't a simple formula. It looks like it's got a simple one embedded in it. This looks like a simple regression, linear regression formula embedded inside, which you might think, oh, I can do causal analysis, but it's still not that easy to say, well, if your math score is 10 points higher, then the likelihood you're going to be good is this much higher. It's it's because uh, it's a straight line that's embedded within a very complicated curve. So we'll just leave that. So how does it work? Well, what is it any good? Well, if I went and used it, plugged it in, this is what ended up happening. This was the linear regression one with the silly numbers of negative probabilities and crazy high probabilities. With the logistic one, I don't get the negative ones. I don't get the ones above one. So it fixes that. But, um, and so I got a tight cluster of bad employees, tight cluster of good ones. But these ones in the middle, it's actually the mistakes look bigger than they were before. And it actually makes at least as many mistakes as before. That's not usually the case. Usually what happens is that logistic model comes out significantly better than the standard regression model. 
And in practice, these logistic models are very popular, that they have a very good success rate in doing classification. So the probabilities are in the enough, are separated enough that we are able to discriminate well between the good ones and the bad ones. But if it's just, if we're thinking, that's our, we're not focused so much on finding probabilities as making, as discriminating, that suggests a different approach. And it's called finding a discriminant function. So here's a scatter plot, and you can do these in Excel, where you can do a scatter plot of the good employees and then go back and superimpose a scatter plot of the bad employees. So I've got blue for good and orange for bad, triangle for being bad. And then I just arbitrarily drew a line, a fence, to separate the good guys from the bad guys. And that you'll see that I made some mistakes. I've got here two good guys that are on the wrong side of the fence, but all the bad guys are on the proper side of the fence. How do I draw that line? Well, there are different techniques used for it. This is a straight line, but it could be a curve. That, as I say, there are different strategies. Discriminant functions have been around for almost 100 years now uh, as a procedure. Um, and they work reasonably well. And as I said, there are different ways even of building the line. Um, let me show you my ignorance um, that there's still so much to learn in machine learning and trying to understand. Uh, you can think of the black box where it's saying, oh, here's yet another method and so on. Um, one of them is called a support vector machine. And there are different methods for doing this. It's uh, they give funny names because we're talking of machine learning. They call this technique a machine. And it involves not just drawing a simple line, but trying to draw a fat line, a whole band. So if you could draw a big fat band between the good and the bad, then it suggests that you can more clearly separate the good and the bad. But the ones that are on your band, what are you going to do with them? It's another story. Maybe that helps give us information to help us feel confident that if you're above the band, that you must really be good. And if you're below the band, you must really be bad because I've got a big band in between. So support vector machines, they're trying to find as wide a band as they can, but also make good classifications. Uh, I read a lot about this, but I still really don't understand it. I'm not comfortable with it. So. Um, Maybe I'm off base. <laughs> As I said, there's too much to learn in this area. I went back with the credit card data we had before, and it got me thinking at the end when we found students were so different with their credit card balances. And it made me think back to suppose that data set was a sample of credit card holders that we had sent a survey to. And so we took stuff that we knew about because it was in our company database. It was part of their application for the credit card. But suppose some of the things were ones that we got because of the survey, because we normally didn't collect the data, like being a student, that we didn't normally know that someone was a student when uh, applying for the credit card. Or maybe they weren't a student when they applied, but they're a student now. That and I'd like to go and predict whether or not they are a student, sort of like target department stores at the beginning of the course that wanted to know which customers were pregnant. So it had data on those customers that had been part of the baby registry. And we wanted to see the difference between those ones that we knew were pregnant and other customers where we didn't have reason to think they were pregnant. Maybe they were, but they never signed up for the baby registry. And uh, and going forward, we'd like to be able to identify who is pregnant without them having to tell us. Let's try to identify who's a student without them having to tell us just by looking at their credit card use. So I thought, well, let me just do a scatter chart. So I took credit rating and balance that 
the first scatter chart that we looked at. And I plotted it for those that were not students, that's the blue, and the ones that were students, that's the orange. And look, at it, it just, this is one begging to be hit with a discriminant function, because if you created an envelope around the blue and said anybody that was outside that envelope is a student, you'd be right almost all the time. And if you said those inside the envelope were likely not to be students, you'd only make a couple of mistakes that you've got only a handful of students among hundreds that were not students. So we could build a discriminant function around this. Um, we can evaluate later as to whether or not it's a very good model, but that's later when we do evaluation. But it just make you think about turning a question around and think, what is it that you want to predict? Now, I'm going to jump to a third type of approach. We've looked at estimating probability, then making a decision, or building a fence and deciding which side of the fence you're on. That maybe I'm going to build a whole bunch of fences. This one we'll look at later, but I'll just go and show you what, I, what I've got in mind here. It's a technique that we're going to look at in Chapter 10 that... Let me go back to the original stuff here. I'll just ignore that line here. Maybe I could hide it. Oh, I can't. There we go. So, uh, no, that's not the picture I want. Hold on. I want uh, this one. And let me just take this line out of here. There we go. With this one here, if you look at it, you could... I can go and draw on this guy. Say, well, look, if your math score is the right of the left of this line, you're probably not very good. I shouldn't hire you. But if your math score is, oops, where did I go here? Over here. Okay, then you are good. So let me put, oops, excuse me, put it over. So if you're over here, you're good. If you're over here, you're bad. If you're in the middle, hmm, okay. So if you're in the middle, then, but your verbal score is above that line, then you're probably good. So that gets me down to this group. How can I differentiate in there? Now it's kind of messy, but maybe I'm not going to build one fence, but a whole series of them. And just simple, little, simple rules. If this, then this. If this, then this. So I'm not a complicated formula function type of thing, but I'm just making um, simple rules and a set of rules. We're going to look at that, but we're going to look at probability before we get into that before we introduce this, because there's a technique and probability that'll give us ideas on how to build rules. You'll see what I mean. What I want to do now is look at something completely different. That we've been sort of looking at formulas, except for this last one that had to be with rules. The discriminant function was a formula. It was a line that a logistic function is a curve, but it's, still, it's a type of line, a curvy line. So both of those are formula-based ones. Are there other ways we can do things? And I posed a discussion question a while ago about trying to do assessments of property values or damage or that type of thing. How do appraisers do their work? And the most common strategy that they use is to go and find similar cases and see what happened. So uh, with the that would probably work really well with the housing data you had in your last assignment. The neighborhood that they were in, in the West End, the uh, homes the furthest north you got towards Bears Road uh, were tended to be post World War II. They were um, homes that were built for returning soldiers and 
that type of thing. And uh, they were very simple construction, but they had a peak roof. Okay, so it's a um, Cape Cod style or a you know a one and a half story type home. The ones that are further to the south are 90 to 120 years old, generally, Edwardian style. And they uh, tend to be two stories, rather skinny, and a flat roof, and a uh, different sort of shape to them. And you'll find the whole street are the same style. So what you might do is, instead of thinking in terms of this wide variety, is look on the street and see, well, was there any house that sold recently on this street? Maybe three or four of them that might have sold. And they're probably of similar age, similar condition, that they may have variations in the other aspects of the property. But a, a property appraiser would probably look to find three to five similar homes, look at the average price of that group over the last, you know, if they sold recently, make some adjustments because you know maybe they had their kitchen renovated or bathrooms renovated that type of thing and from there come up with a figure so it's not a fancy formula just um, an average of several with some adjustments but it's based upon finding ones that are similar and we can easily imagine what that looks like so this idea of similarity and we have uh, a lot of instances where we've made decisions where we think back to similar cases we've seen before, how did we handle it, and then we went forward. But if you want to formalize this as something you use all the time, you're going to need to have some guidelines on how you're going to do it. How, how do you formalize how we identify who is similar? What, what would fit into that group? that you're going to average out or do something with. And we're looking at categorization, so it's fitting into one group or another group. So we've got classification as opposed to value estimation. But this method is common. It's called K nearest neighbor. And so find the nearest neighbors are ones that are as similar as possible. And K is how many you look at. You look at one, you look at three, five, 15, how many? neighbors should you look at that let's look at a picture here so here are the 20 cases I had before the good employees over here bad employees over there and now suppose I take a new case and I throw it in the middle and I decide okay how would I classify this new case should this be a new, good employee or a bad employee well, I've got a couple of bad ones right next to them. But if I look more broadly at neighbors, maybe look at seven neighbors, I've got four good ones, three bad ones. Well, okay, majority are good. Maybe this one will be good. And that's how I made my decision. Okay. But they say that the bad ones are actually the closest ones. <laughs> Um, how do we weigh that? So it's, it's uh, do I just count how many are good and bad within that group of seven? Or should I look at how close they were, how similar they were? Hmm. And then, well, what do you mean by closeness? Uh, you saw it because of the picture. But that's a matter of scale. That I'm treating, you know, I've stretched out the math scale and shrunk the ver uh, verbal scale, I'm measuring distance by this straight line out, but math score is probably more important than the verbal score. So how should I be treating this stuff? That uh, this seems like a simplistic sort of picture thing. There's a lot more that goes into it. That how do I measure these things? So I've got a couple things. How many should I look at? How do I measure distance? How do I treat importance of them? So some people put a lot of attention on measuring distance. I, it's not a, that important to me, but you could measure distance. I've got two variables, X and Y here, so the different scores. Is distance 
how far they are apart if I was to fly a plane from A to B? Or is it like driving down streets? I want to go from St. Mary's to the McDonald Bridge. So I'm going to go down Roby Street, turn right on North Street, drive to the bridge. So I, I can't fly across the bridge. If I could fly to the bridge, I'd fly right over. Um, how do we measure distance? And so there are different distance measures. These are two of the most common, road distance and this flying distance. The uh, Some of this, I think, this focus on distance, in part has to do with uh, the nearest neighbor idea. Nearest neighbor is a very common approach used in finding routes for trucks that if you were uh, in, during COVID, you're getting everything delivered to your house uh, that or your apartment, whether it be stuff from Amazon or, or Uber Eats or what have you. And generally a driver has got a variety of stops to make and must find a route to go from one stop to the next and then back to the start again, possibly. And to do that with traveling the shortest total distance and do it as quickly as possible. That one common approach, very simplistic one where I don't need any fancy tools is called nearest neighbor. If this is where you're starting from, then look at the stop the next stop for you to go to and that is closest to you. Go to the closest one and then I guess be like if you could imagine traveling among the orange if I'm up here I'd probably go here then down there then up here and over there and down here oh well do I go this way or that way maybe I go down then across then back that how do I find my route? Well part of finding that route is do you get to drive in a straight line or do you have to drive along streets? And if you were driving in the city, it's long streets. If you were a container ship finding your route to go to different ports, well, you don't have streets. You can go straight from A to B. But, um, which one it works? It's just one issue, but it's a tiny issue. We've got so many others to worry about that. There are different units I've got here. So if I'm measuring distance, whichever one you want, it depends upon how I combine the two units. How do I treat combine verbal score and math score? What if they were on different scales? What if verbal score was one to 10 and your math score was be between zero and a thousand? Well, it's harder to measure things that, you know, do you treat them both the same? You know, a thousand is a big number. Ten is pretty small by its state. How do you combine age and income and education and qualitative things like gender or employer um, or home location? Yeah, those may be relevant. If you are looking at, you look similar to, you know, your brother. Well, is that based on what? Your hair color, your height, your weight? Uh, the shape of your nose. There's a whole bunch of different variables there. How do you measure them? Yeah, it's not just how do you measure the different noses that you could have. That the you know I'm saying closeness with binary variables. You are or you're not one thing or another. But some of them are, are fuzzier than that. And are they equally important? When we did multiple regression, we found some variables. Uh, like your credit rating was very important, but others like your age are not important. So um, how do we combine all these things together? Getting complicated. And then how many neighbors should we look at? Um, do we look, uh, generally we look at an odd number, but uh, so that you can break ties. If you had, if you only looked at, at four, that, uh, two yes, two no, then how do you make the decision between the two? The um, An odd number, I don't have to worry about ties, but if I look at only at a small number, maybe I get thrown off by just looking at too few, but the small number of neighbors, they're very, very close neighbors. If I look at a larger data set, I'm going to have to go further away. They're not as near, so they're not 
may be as similar. How do I make the decision? I think in the notes I talk about the uh, uh, case of, of Daniel Ortiz, who is a player for the Boston Red Sox and uh, super superstar, and led Boston to winning the World Series, and but then went into a slump, and he was not doing very well. He was very expensive, and there were many suggestions he should be traded, that he's getting too old. He's past his prime. Uh, get some new blood in there. And one fellow, that uh, the guy that runs the um, website I've referred to before, um, 538, that he said, well, he's a real uh, baseball fanatic. He went through the history books on baseball, and there's all kinds of stats, and looked up players that were similar to Daniel Ortiz, and that went, that they were similar in all kinds of characteristics of players. And he looked specifically at ones that went into a slump and their performance dropped off. What happened to them a few years later? And he found in the majority of cases that their performance rebounded. And his advice was be patient, that this guy is likely to turn around because similar cases turned around. And as it turned out, a couple of years later, yes, we saw a significant turnaround. And once again, he became most valuable player, led the Red Sox to another World Series. That the it was based, the decision on how do you classify this player was based upon those nearest neighbors. That the analysis was done using a formula that of measuring similarity to be able to find those cases. But it's a really challenging job to come up with that appropriate formula because there are lots of things to measure and incorporate. And going forward and using it, you need all the old data that before when you fit your model and you got a formula, you could throw out the data. You don't need it anymore because you've got a formula to tell you what to do in the future. But in this one, just like in that picture, I had to go back, and if I had a new case, I would go back to a um, picture I had. Here was that one. Here he is. And I'd have to go and look and explore and find those cases. Uh, data storage is cheap these days, but it's a different, it's nicer when you've just got a simple formula you can use, that you don't have to go and, and sort through your data all over again. So. Uh, and we've got to decide, like many of the things, as to what's important or not. Also, do you keep the really old data? It, customers, if you had a great model that you built based upon 2019, it fell apart in 2020 because of COVID and everybody's behavior changed. And now we're into 2021 and we're getting vaccines and COVID's starting to get under control. And our behavior is changing again. Today, they just uh, ended the lockdown in Toronto. And so places are starting to open up again. And that it'll slowly change during this year. 2022, it's going to be different again. And that maybe some activity will get back to the old way in 2024 or 2025. But by then, what we knew about people in 2019, is it still relevant? Now, things change, so we have to be careful about which data we keep using to measure similarity. That's why in your assignment, I used only data for during 2020, well, the last 12 months of data, roughly, to be able to build the assignment because stuff far before COVID, 2018 is irrelevant today. So there are a lot of these things so many different issues. How do you do this and build your models? Generally, what we do is sort of trial and error. When we did regression, we tried something, then we tried something else, then we tried something else. The same way with nearest neighbor, same way with discriminant functions to some extent, that you slowly build what your model is. So what you'll have to do is probably split your data set in two 
keep one set of data that you haven't looked at and the other one you're going to use to train and build your model. Do all of these different things. So, so far in our survey, we've looked at three approaches. Build a formula to estimate probability, build a fence, or go find similar cases and let them guide the classification. Which method's best? Well, none of them, all of them. That there, there is no best method. All of the methods have been successfully used elsewhere or in, in applications. Sometimes what they may do is during that training phase, instead of training the data to be the best nearest neighbor model, they also use the data to train it for the best discriminant function and train it for the best logistic function. So I got three models. Then when we go and try out our method to see how well it's going to work in practice on our test data set, then we find out, well, of the three methods, which one works best. Um, maybe we don't get a clear distinction there. Uh, we may look to see which cases do two out of the three methods agree <laughs> and go with that one. And we develop our own hybrid. There are all kinds of different things that you could possibly do. But to do that and get into evaluation, first, we need to understand probability and to understand some of those other methods, uh, the even logistic. We need to understand probability. Um, that. Uh, understand what we mean by risk. Further, when we understand that, uh, that understanding of probability is key to that doing the evaluation, it's actually going to show us, give us some insight into other ways we could possibly think about how to do classification, either directly or indirectly. One of them is going to be a direct approach. One's going to be indirect. A strategy that's good for understanding probabilities turns out to be a strategy that might be good for doing classification. So hopefully that helps. Um, sorry that this is a just a standard recorded one and not um, from 8.30 or 10 o'clock. Anyway, uh, hopefully we'll get things working properly on Wednesday. Bye for now.